Almost everyone is aware of the existence of apartheid in Southern Africa. This is because of the struggle being waged within Southern Africa, today and in the past. This struggle is for freedom, freedom from legalised racism, poverty, exploitation and brutality. This is the struggle against apartheid. the ultimate system of racial discrimination, the system of laws designed to enforce the dominance of the white minority over the black majority. The system of apartheid laws was established in 1948 by the Afrikaner Nationalist Party following an election where no blacks were allowed to vote. Europeans have exploited black Africa since the 17th century. The enslavement of black Africans and the establishment of white settlements began this process of exploitation. The white settlers, together with the European armies, quickly set about the destruction of the tribal societies, starting a struggle for land and power that has continued to the present day. South Africa and Namibia have been central to the overall exploitation of Africa. They are two of the most mineral-rich countries in the world. South Africa produces large proportion of the world's gold and diamonds, and Namibia produces large quantities of uranium. The disgustingly low wages and appalling conditions in Southern Africa mean extremely large profits are made from these countries. These profits are maintained by force. The brutal exploitation of the black population has forced it to fight back. 
Central to their struggle has been the youth of Namibia and South Africa. Namibia has a population of around 2 million people, with Angola on its northern border and apartheid South Africa to the south. Namibia has been illegally occupied by South Africa since the 1940s. South Africa has a population of around 25 million people, over 20 million of which are black. Apartheid means the separation of blacks and whites in all aspects of life, starting with education. As you know, the education system is separated along racial lines. You've got white education and Bantu education. So the role of uh, Bantu education and the role for, uh, of education amongst uh, uh, young black people, uh, as the state perceives it, is to um, make them hewers of wood and drawers of, uh, of, of water. Um, on the job level, um, many, many young uh, black people are unemployed at the moment. Uh, basically because uh, education is not geared to, um, to educate um, young blacks for, for the high technology um, that uh, South Africa has. All the engineering jobs and all the um, jobs related to science and mathematics are exclusively for, for white people. The boundary educational system has been the pillar of the colonial apartheid rule in Namibia. It has been there to maintain the status quo in Namibia. It is a system that has been specially invented by the South African government, especially for the blacks, because they believe that being black is being inferior. It is being intelligently transparent. You have no brains. And that's why they have invented this system which drives home the point of inferiority back to the black population. In fact, this can be seen through the words of a vote when he said that uh, uh, a native has, be, has to be taught from the very childhood that equality with Europeans is not for them. In the 1950s, youth and students took the streets in protest against Bantu education. Many colleges and universities were closed or occupied. Thousands of youth took part in the demonstrations. Unable to stop the protest, the apartheid regime resorted to violent repression. At Sharpville, the police opened fire on a peaceful demonstration, killing 69 people and wounding 200 more. A week later, the government declared a state of emergency. One of the leaders of the African National Congress and the black people at this time was Nelson Mandela. He and the ANC had been active for many years in organising and mobilising people in a non-violent movement against apartheid. After Sharpville, he helped form a policy of active resistance, which included armed struggle and sabotage missions. There are many people who feel that uh, the reaction of the government to our stay at home, ordering a general mobilization, arming the white community, arresting 10,000 of Africans, the show of force throughout the country. Notwithstanding our clear declaration that this campaign is being run on peaceful and non-binary lines, close the chapter as far as our methods of political struggle are concerned. The banning of the African National Congress and the Pan-Africanist Congress in 1961 led to the establishment of the arm wings of the liberation movement. The 
The people initially involved were youth. Merchants like Mandela, Tisulu and Tambo formed in Conte Wisesue, Spear of the Nation. The liberation movement in Namibia took up arms against South Africa in 1966. SWAPO, the South West African People's Organization, established its military wing, the People's Liberation Army of Namibia. The War of Liberation had started. Namibia is a large country with a small population, approximately two and a quarter million people. Since the Second World War, it has been colonised by South Africa against the wishes of the Namibian people. And when South Africa refused to uh, abide by the various uh, uh, resolutions of the uh, United Nations, the UN General Assembly in 1966 terminated the mandate of South Africa over our country. And since then, South Africa has been uh, illegally occupying our country. Papa is a, it's a liberation movement uniting together all those who are oppressed and uh, rallying them behind the national liberation struggle. We are fighting against the South African regime. We are fighting against this illegal occupation of our country by South Africa. And what we are saying is that South Africa should get out of our country and leave us alone so that we decide for ourselves. We are fighting against colonialism. We are fighting against the exploitation of our mineral and natural resources. We are fighting to establish a democratic government where all the inhabitants in Namibia, despite of their sex or color, will be equal. The establishment of the armed struggle within both Namibia and South Africa seriously threatened the stability of the apartheid regime. Swato, which stands for South Western Township, lies just outside Johannesburg in South Africa. It's a black ghetto that houses around two million black people. On the 16th of June 1976, thousands of unarmed school students gathered in Soweto to peacefully protest against the imposition of the language Afrikaans within the schools. Afrikaans is the language of the white South Africans, and so the language of the school students' oppressors. The demonstration was brutally repressed in full view of the world media. The police systematically massacred the youth. Over 600 unarmed school children were killed that day. The demonstration turned into rebellion and Soweto soon became ungovernable. Kasinga is one of those dark days in the calendar of the history of the liberation struggle of Namibia. It is a day which I always remember and I think it's an event which I will never be able to scrap away from my mind. This year 1988 will mark 10 years of the Kasinga massacre and I believe that it will bring back that morning on the 4th of May 1978 when South Africa bombarded that camp. It was an experience for some of us who were just leaving Namibia and have arrived in Kasinga. It, uh, it was easy to kill so many people because most of the people were at one place receiving their daily routine task, that is collecting firewood or cutting grass to make dwellings. And suddenly I had a big bang and uh, I could see that the sky was completely dark. Bombshells were falling, bullets were cross-firing, and people were falling down one after the other. Those who did not instantly die because maybe they were not fatally wounded, at the end did not survive because the nurses and all the other medical staff were among the first to die. It took me about three hours to get out of the camp. And one thing I always remember is that the next morning when I arrived, when we came back to the camp, I could not recognize the place at all. It was leveled to ashes and everywhere was corpses of dead people laying scattered around. The 
The massacres at Soweto and Kasinga came at a time when apartheid was in crisis. Liberation movements of South Africa and Namibia were becoming increasingly threatening. Youth and students were at the forefront of this rise in resistance as the moving force behind a new politics, the politics of the black consciousness movement. The philosophy of black consciousness expresses group pride and the determination by the blacks to rise and attain the envisaged self. At the heart of this kind of thinking is the realization by the blacks that the most potent weapon, weapons in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Once the latter has been so effectively manipulated and controlled by the oppressor as to make the oppressed believe that he is, he is a liability to the white man then there will be nothing the oppressed can do that will really scare its powerful masters. Hence thinking along the lines of black consciousness makes a black man see himself as being entire in himself and not as an extension of a broom or additional leverage to some machine. In 1969, Biko helped form a new student organization, the South African Students' Organization Say So, which became the basis of the black consciousness movement. The importance of black consciousness to the youth of South Africa is indisputable. During the 70s, black consciousness brought new life into the liberation movement. Many youth were involved in black consciousness organizations, most notably the South African Students' Movement, which organized school students and was to become the leadership of the Soweto rebellions. In September 1977, Steve Biko was killed while in detention. International outcry was enormous, and more importantly, the protests continued. It took the government four years to take measures against us. Even today, we are still accused of racism. This is a mistake. We know that all interracial groups in South Africa are relationships in which whites are superior, blacks inferior. So, as a prelude, Whites must be made to realize that they are only human, not superior. Same with blacks. They must be made to realize that they are also human, not inferior. For all of us, this means that South Africa is not European, but African. During the late 70s, an important new force emerged, trade unions for black workers. New union formations were established and culminated in the creation of Kisatu in 1984. Kisatu's membership has now grown to over a million workers. The two most important struggles Kisatu has faced have been the rail workers' strike and the miners' strike in 1987. Sawu, the rail workers' union, went on strike after one member was sacked. The South African government sacked all the workers after the strike had halted the entire railway system. After a powerful struggle, the strike was victorious and the apartheid regime was forced to climb down and reinstate all rail workers. The South African miners' strike, although unable to force significant advances in wages and conditions, threatened the state's power to rule was the biggest national strike of black workers in South African history. The apartheid regime has always attacked trade unions when they have taken any industrial action. On April the 22nd, 1987, a meeting of striking rail workers were attacked by the South African Defence Forces. Six strikers were killed and many more were injured. During the miners' strike, over 20 strikers were killed. Bozis Maigiso is a national is a general secretary of the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa. Uh, he was arrested about two years ago by the Bota regime and he was put into solitary confinement for about one year. Then after that they take the charge him, of which they charge him with high treasure. Uh, I think the state the put charges on him because now he said he was active in the, in the township where he was trying to, in, to form the new structures which, which, which 
those structures which were going to replace the existing structures. Now the, the street alleged that uh, those structures were NC1. That is why now they, they put the, the charge in with high treasure because uh, he, he was the first trade union leader to try and link the trade union with the, with the community in the township where, where he was staying. I think uh, the role of COSATO in the political struggle in South Africa is very, very important because we find that the, the economy of the country is with the, is with the workers, is controlled by the workers. Now it's very important for COSATO to take any part in the strike of South Africa. Uh, the strike, that strike of three-day strike was very, very effective because now it was the first time where all the people of South Africa, they face the truth that now they must forget all their differences and face the state because now the call, although it was initiated by COSAT and other organizations, but the call was extended to all and apartheid organizations irrespective of political ideology. Those organizations, they, respond, they, they responded positively. They just left out the different differences and they marched forward to face the state. In the 80s, the South African government declared a state of emergency as a method of legal repression. In a state of emergency, the regime takes on an increased powers to deal with specific crises. This time, the crisis has lasted for over three years. The actual emergency is that the liberation movement is growing stronger and is increasingly challenging the power of the apartheid regime. The apartheid regime has total control over the media. All coverage of the struggle against apartheid is censored. International media coverage is effectively banned. Over the last three years, over 40,000 people have been detained. Every month, over 100 people are killed. more death, victory is certain. This is the slogan of the black youth of South Africa. A new generation of young blacks has entered the struggle against apartheid. They are organizing themselves in several ways, in youth committees, in youth congresses which are mushrooming throughout South Africa, um, and in joining the mass democratic movement, uh, like the United Democratic Front, the Congress of South African Trade Unions, um, the South African Youth Congress. The South African Youth Congress, SACO, is the national coordinating body of local and regional youth committees. In total, SACO has over 300,000 members, and is affiliated to the United Democratic Front, the UDF being an umbrella organisation of community groups based in the different townships. The youth uh, are the largest component of the United Democratic Front, and their specific tasks within the UDF is to ensure that all the major policy decisions which are taken by the UDF and all the political programs which are taken by the UDF are implemented and therefore the South African Youth Congress which is as I said um, is the 
it forms the largest component uh, of the UDF, is active in trying to link youth work with community work, with trade union work. We in Britain have a role to play. We must organise ourselves to fight apartheid, to show our disgust for the apartheid regime and to end the misery of our sisters and brothers in southern Africa. We must campaign to stop the British companies and our government from aiding the apartheid regime. The system of apartheid must go. It's an abomination to the whole world. So what is Britain doing about apartheid? A third of southern Africa's total trade is with Britain. British companies make huge profits from southern Africa. To British companies, the question of apartheid is not a moral issue. It's a question of profit. Apartheid provides British companies with a cheap workforce and permission to exploit southern Africa's natural resources. In return, British companies pay taxes to the apartheid state. This can only help the racists. It provides them with the money they need to buy the guns, tanks and aircrafts to oppress the black peoples in southern Africa and to invade Angola. People of Southern Africa are calling for economic sanctions to be taken against the South African regime. They want all international trade with South Africa to stop, to isolate apartheid and pressurise the white minority. As far as sanctions is concerned, I think the COSATO policy is clear that we do support sanctions because we believe that it might bring up a change. It might put maximum pressure on the government in order to change in South Africa. We rely on the British people themselves, on the workers, on the youth, on the students, to impose their own sanctions, to boycott South African goods. Margaret Thatcher is saying, telling the world that the people who are going to suffer in South Africa are the black workers. At the moment in South Africa, there are more than three million black people who are out of work. Those workers are out of work because of the British companies. Now, if, he is, if she is so very concerned about the black people, why don't you tell the, this company not to retrench the people? Our present government is against sanctions. Our government has prevented the EC, Commonwealth and the United Nations from adopting a pro-sanctions position. Sanctions would mean less profit for British companies. The Prime Minister has consistently argued that sanctions are wrong, as they would result in more poverty and unemployment for black people in southern Africa. Yet most organisations of the black majority are calling for sanctions as a positive action towards ending apartheid in support of the black majority. The anti-apartheid movement has launched a campaign for the introduction of sanctions by the British government. In 1986, 300,000 people marched in London for sanctions now. Opinion polls show that the majority of the British population are in favour of sanctions. The Trade Union Congress has a policy of full support for sanctions against apartheid and to support British workers taking action against trade with South Africa. This policy has been effectively carried out by trade unions, such as the dockers in Newcastle and Southampton, who have refused to move Namibian uranium and arms destined for the South African government. The Dunn store workers in Dublin went on strike for two years and have won the right not to handle South African goods. My, my reason to come over in Britain is to see the other BTR shops that uh, in, in different plans in order to look for solidarity support. As you know, that uh, BTR management, is, they dismiss about 950 workers in some call. The strike is still unresolved since then. We did many campaigns in South Africa as well as abroad, but as we, as BTR National Shop Trade Council. Uh, last month we met and we, di we decided to take a further action against BTR management. That further action, it was meant that we are going to take a national strike of which is going to be, in, which is going to involve all nine plants of BTR plants in South Africa. That is why I had to come over here to look for solidarity support as well as financial support. Uh, in order to call a meeting in South Africa and try to mobilize and conscientize the workers over this some call issue. Support from the British trade unions and the British public to pressurize the BTR management to reinstate the sack Sam coal workers, recognize NUMSA as a legitimate union and pay fair wages.
The anti-apartheid movement has launched various campaigns against British companies who have a large involvement with apartheid. The Boycott Barclays campaign forced Barclays Bank's announcement they had ended their operations in Southern Africa. The anti-apartheid movement is currently engaged in a campaign to boycott Shell Oil. Shell directly supplies oil and petrol to the South African Army and Defence Forces. Shell's receipts are said to be 8% down in Britain due to the campaign. In St Paul's Bristol, an apartheid-free zone has been established in which no South African goods are sold. Similar campaigns are taking place in Glasgow, Birmingham and in other towns and cities in Britain. Nationally, Tesco stores are being leafleted and customers are asked not to buy South African goods. The Sharpville Six are six young people, black South Africans from Sharpville, who were arrested after a councillor was killed who was collaborating with this, the fascist state. Um, they they are, were put on trial and were found guilty of being in a crowd, and for this they are going to hang. However, they are at the moment appealing. The stage of the appeal is that um, they their defence lawyers have submitted new evidence and the prosecution has submitted their own evidence. So it's up to the same judge to decide whether he retries them. However, it seems likely that they are going to die. The Sharpville Six were due to hang on July the 18th, 1988. Due to international pressure, the hanging was postponed, pending a hearing to decide whether they will be allowed the right to appeal. The campaign for their release is still continuing. What we are appealing to the British youth is to campaign fiercely for the independence of Namibia by, for example, setting up Namibia support groups either in their areas or at their educational institutions or at their workplaces where they can raise the awareness of these people to understand what is happening in Namibia. We've got the Namibia Support Committee, which is working for the solution of the question of Namibia. The Namibia Support Committee runs campaigns to provide material aid for the Swapo refugee camps. It is working with the NUS to create scholarships for Namibian youth in British colleges. On June 11th in Wembley Stadium, the anti-apartheid movement held an all-day concert, which was televised in 60 countries, with an estimated audience of over 400 million. On that day, 25 people started the march from Glasgow to London. In Glasgow, 35,000 turned out to see the march off. In London, the march was joined by a national anti-apartheid demonstration of 250,000 people. Demonstrating solidarity with the people of the South Africa and Namibia, and particularly with the African National Congress and Namibia, the Swap of Namibia. The whole point of having the anti apartheid is to give solidarity with the struggling people of Southern Africa and also to put pressure on the international community and on our own government to ensure that we isolate South Africa and the races in South Africa. The aim of this is to put pressure on that government to change its ways and to bring about a radical change in South Africa towards a democratic and non-racial Southern Africa and obviously to succeed in gaining the independence of Namibia. The Free Mandela March, as with all anti-apartheid mobilisations of recent years, was predominantly made up of youth and students. I mean, I think that within the anti-apartheid movement, youth need to organise themselves as well because, you know, there is a separate dynamic to youth. Um, young people know mainly young people. It's a lot easier for people to get involved in, um, in a youth committee with people of their own age and the rest of it. Um, and they can much more easily organise other youth in this country um, in solidarity with the black youth of South Africa who were struggling against apartheid there, right? And um, certainly um, we, we in Birmingham at the Apartheid Youth Committee strongly believe that the youth in South Africa will be uh, play a key role 
in the revolution against apartheid there? Well, I think it's important for youth committees to exist because they're very open and a lot of young people can, will find it much easier to just go and help if they're more accessible. Anti-apartheid youth committees are youth organisations designed to involve and give voice to youth in Britain who are against apartheid. In Southern Africa, it's the youth who are at the forefront of the struggle, and Britain is the youth that constitute the majority of the solidarity movement. The role of youth committees is to organise the youth into an effective movement to oppose all British involvement in apartheid and to aid the youth of Southern Africa in their struggle. I think it is the youth who, who are going, going to change South Africa or Azania. Um, and that's why I, I think that uh, the youth should get involved. Also in Britain, the black youth especially, because it's our brothers and sisters who are dying. The parallels between racism in South Africa, uh, racism in South Africa and, and in Britain must be drawn upon. Uh, although racism is not enshrined in the constitution of this country, there's no doubt that it exists and it's important that people are aware of the comfort that South Africa gives to racists in this country. Remember, in South Africa, you see, black people can, can go with a boycott. They, they will survive with a boycott because they've survived uh, uh, the most unhumane oppression since, since this country was formed. The white people won't survive a day. And this is the fear that, that Bota has, all their cabinet. And this is also the fear that Britain has because if South Africa uh, changes, like, like Zimbabwe did, then Britain will no longer have its big monopoly. The big multinational companies will, will no longer ha have their, their say in, in South, South Africa. Anti-apartheid youth committees have involved themselves in many diverse activities, both in organising support for anti-apartheid movement events and organising their own activities, including the Youth Against Apartheid conference held in Birmingham. I got involved for the same reason um, loads of people got involved in 1985. Um, that's because every night on television we were seeing people being um, whipped and sandboxed and shot dead in the townships in South Africa. Um, and uh, the Youth Against Apartheid group um, was, uh, you know, composed of people who, uh, you know, were, uh, you know, very, very angry and felt the importance of uh, building some form of solidarity uh, in Britain. And uh, we participated in the anti-apartheid national demonstrations that were called in June and November of 1985, and uh, did our best to encourage um, other young people in Birmingham um, to uh, join the movement. Uh, and, uh, you know, for sanctions against South Africa. It was first set up two years ago um, from members who were in local groups who were young people and they sent out letters to the young socialist groups in Manchester and the area and to trade unions and to colleges and schools and we got a big response from that. We had 200 members at one point. The most refreshing thing about the Birmingham anti apartheid Youth Committee is unlike most sort of uh, political campaigns and even campaigns in solidarity with the people of South Africa, it wasn't a white dominated organisation. By the end of March, the majority of people who were attending weekly meetings were um, black youth from Hansworth and Borsleith and, uh, uh, in Birmingham. And um, rapidly these pe people became the leadership of the campaign and uh, became much more involved in the anti-apartheid movement itself. So that was um, a real big breakthrough in many uh, senses uh, because the previous, my previous experience of all sorts of political campaigns in Birmingham is that um, the composition has never reflected the fact that 22% um, of the Birmingham population are uh, black. I think it's very important that young people are able to get together on a national level as well as a local level and um, to see each other and to talk and debate issues that concern us like solidarity with young South Africans and Namibians and the frontline states. Um, I remember um, when I was dead young and everything, um, the Soweto massacre in 1976, and one of the most disgusting things for me was the hypocrisy of um, the British press. Um, 
and the fact that the truth um, never really came out on British television for years. Um, people were still talking about an official death toll of 69 people and uh, I was appalled by the fact that there wasn't uh, <coughs> more of a mass response to the slaughter of hundreds and hundreds of school children who were just protesting against being forced to speak an alien language, uh, Afrikaans, in, in their own schools. And uh, seeing the photographs of Hector Peterson um, after he was shot, the first, first school child to be shot at, uh, outside the Orlando West Stadium uh, in Soweto, um, um, you know, shocked me into uh, realising the importance of um, challenging Britain's complic complicity with uh, the uh, South African regime. I know that the attitudes of the people out there is so, so wrong and, and it's so, so stupid that I wanted to do something to stop it. And uh, every little that I do here, I know it's only a little bit, but together with other young people, I feel that there is a chance that we will change it and that we can break it down. And, and this is what we've got to do. The Youth of Britain must come together to form new youth committees and student anti-apartheid groups to build a powerful movement against apartheid. Many people have been killed during the struggle for liberation in Southern Africa. They didn't die in vain. Adepts can only feel the determination of the black peoples to overthrow apartheid. With such an iron will, the black masses, workers, students, women and youth together cannot be defeated. The revolution will come, and with it, an end of apartheid and an end to exploitation. Power will be taken back by the people of Southern Africa, so that black and white will have an equal right to live, work, and enjoy the benefits of the enormous wealth of the region. Not an equality to exploit or make profit, but an equality to life. The only way to end the killings, the repression and the misery in Southern Africa is to remove the cause, the white racist state and apartheid.